Good afternoon and welcome to our online webinar. My name is Dr. Rhonda E. Alexander and I am an assistant professor of otorhinolaryngology and head and neck surgery at the University of Texas Medical School here in Houston. Um, now, that's a long intimidating title I know, but basically what that boils down to is the fact that I treat ear, nose, and throat disorders. However, as director of the Texas Voice Performance Institute, prior to joining um, our campus here, I did do an additional year of fellowship training which is oriented towards the treatment of voice and swallowing disorders. So what we're going to talk about today, please, will be um, your voice uh, and we're going to be taking our questions at the end. Uh, continue to go ahead and log in and, and type them in, but um, please just know they'll address them at the end. Um, and um, we'll, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So in today's talk, we'll go over the anatomy of the voice. So what are the parts that make it up? The physiology of the voice. How does it work? Uh, pathophysiology, which is when it goes wrong, and some tips that you can employ to help make your voice the best that it can be when you need it. So where does your voice come from? So what we're looking at here is a front-on view of the structures that protect and support the voice box. We're looking at the hyoid bone. So um, the hyoid bone, as labeled in the diagram, uh, is the only bone in the body that doesn't uh, connect to another bone, actually. It's pretty unique. And we also can see the thyroid cartilage, which is labeled. And that's, the, the, in general, the Adam's apple. And it's the protector of the voice box. Uh, and then the cricoid cartilage, which is also very special in that it's the only complete ring of the airway. So this is us looking straight ahead at the voice box. Our next video picture is going to be a view from the side. So if you cut that last picture in half and open it like a book, what we can see are the structures of the voice box kind of from the side, looking from the middle out towards the right side. We again see the hyoid bone near the top, and everything else is made out of cartilage, that cushy, squishy material that allows it to be a little bit flexible when it needs to. Uh, you can see the arretinoid cartilage that's about midway uh, down the back on the right-hand side, and that is the structure that the vocal cord is attached to, the moving structure. So what does a good voice come from? Uh, it requires three different components. So you need a healthy lower airway, which is made up of your lungs. So are they able to take in the air and then deliver it back out effectively? Next, you need a healthy larynx. Remember, that is the word for voice box. So the vocal cords need to be able to move properly, come right up next to each other, be soft and vibrate, and also not have any lumps or bumps on them. And then you need healthy resonators. So a resonator is anything that amplifies and modifies the sound. So in humans, that's going to include the um, throat, the nose, the sinuses, the mouth, lips, and teeth. They all help to shape the sound. And that's why when I pinch my nose like this, my voice sounds different than when I release it and have my normal voice because I've changed the resonance chamber for the voice. So is your voice an instrument? Let's see. An instrument musically is defined as a power source with a vibration source and a resonator. So let's compare a few instruments and then the human body uh, and see if you can come to an agreement about that one. So let's look at a clarinet. In a clarinet, your power is your, the human who's playing its exhaled breath. The vibration comes from the reed of the uh, clarinet. And then the resonator, which helps make it sound or have the voice of a clarinet, is the bell. With a piano, we have the hammers that generate the kinetic or moving energy. And then we have the strings, which make the vibration. And the body and shape of the piano's body is what makes for the different characteristic sounds. Um, the difference between a baby grand and an upright and a player piano have to do with the way that the body is constructed. So again, in a human being, 
The power source is the exhaled breath. The vibration is the vocal cords. And the resonator is the throat, nose, mouth, and other structures that help shape it. So I hope you're on board with the fact that your voice is a finely tuned precision instrument. So how do we get that good breathing that's required to have a great voice? So it needs to come from the diaphragm. So that means allowing your belly to move out so that the diaphragm, the big muscle underneath your lungs, can pull down and open up the lungs. It gives you the ability to have the longest duration of phrasing, which is how long you can speak before needing another breath. And it also gives you the least fatigue or tiredness. So because your belly needs to move in order for you to do this, you can't have one tight clothing. Just think about it. You've never seen an opera singer in a fitted bodice. They always have an ampere waist so that their belly has room to move so they can breathe as deeply as they need to to generate the good sound. So again, we have a slice of the voice box. This slice is um, looking forward and cutting down and then opening like a book, and we're looking towards the back. What we can see here are um, the air passage in the middle, and then starting from the top, the first um, kind of outpouching of tissue is the fall vocal cord. That's going to come up later in some of our videos that we look at um, in terms of where the voice is coming from. And then there's a little space called the ventricle which makes lubricating um, mucus normal amounts are necessary for the vocal cords to behave the way that they should. And then uh, where it's labeled on the right hand side the glottis, that is where your true vocal cord is. The true vocal cord is the one that makes the best most precise sound. Uh, and then again we're also seeing some of the structures like the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage and the rings of the trachea that help support the air passage. So let's take a look at the vocal cycle. How do these vocal cords actually work to create the sound? When they start you bring the two vocal cords together and they're closed. But because you're exhaling and pushing breath and air out they actually begin to separate at the bottom, as you can see in two and three in the figure on the right. Now, when the pressure from exhaling overcomes the force with which they're closed, they separate, like in four and five. But because that fast-moving air as you're exhaling actually doesn't push very strongly against the vocal cords, it creates a negative pressure and sucks them back together, which we see the start of in six seven and in eight they're back in touch so the bottom edge actually begins to touch again and we complete the cycle when the vocal cords are completely back together in ten and note that ten looks just like one so it's a cycle and it's going on in men about 150 to 200 times per second while speaking and in most women between 200 and 300 times per second. For sopranos it can be as high as four or five hundred times every second while they're making the voice. What we're looking at here is a picture of the normal human voice box we're standing on the tongue inside the person's mouth and looking downward into the throat. So those two white stripes that you can see, those are the vocal cords. In normal function, they will come right next to each other as I described and have a soft flag-like vibration that is the, the vibration source for making the voice. Now, let's talk about safely using your voice care for just a moment. There are three basic voices, and this has to do with uh, volume to a certain extent. So the primary voice is the confidential voice. And this is the voice that you would use to tell someone you trust a secret in a room where the door is open and there are people around who aren't necessarily in the room with you. So this is a calm, controlled, quiet voice with no pain or pressure while uh, you're making it, so there's no squeezing in the throat. And uh, there's not a lot of um, projection, and the sound doesn't carry very far. 
this is how uh, I prefer to communicate with my friends and family. Uh, and it works best in what we call an acoustically or sound-based favorable environment. So the confidential voice is really tough to use at the zoo or outdoors just because you don't have the sound bouncing back towards you. It's going out into the world. The next voice is the public voice. And this is the voice that I think most teachers and other professors end up using the majority of the time because you need to project to a few more people. So the public voice requires that good belly breathing that we talked about before in order for the vocal cords to work well and not be damaged. Um, the public voice does require a fair amount of training and unfortunately most people who need to use it don't have that training and that's why they can get into trouble. And then there's what I like to call the emergency voice, also known as screaming. <laughs> Now, the emergency voice really should be limited to situations where someone is about to be injured or um, there's something critical going on. If we use our emergency voice too often, what we can end up with are injuries on the vocal cord, which can be severe uh, and require a long recovery. So let's work on being confidential in public and not so much emergency. Sometimes this is also called the outside voice. Um, that's often how it's described for children. But notice that none of these three voices includes the whisper. The whisper, like this, actually puts more stress on your vocal cords than any of the other three voices that I advocate using. So let's talk about some of the ways that the voice can go a little awry and what we can do about them. So let's think about it. We have a voice problem, uh, and that problem can be uh, I'm having difficulty uh, uh, with predicting what sound is going to come out of my mouth when I'm speaking. I'm having pain or a lot of pressure in making my voice. My voice sounds the wrong note, or I'm having breathing problems along with it. So who do we call on? You need to make your team to help you. That team should start with a laryngologist. If you don't have access to a laryngologist, which is someone who treats voice and airway and swallowing disorders, I would start with um, a generally trained ear, nose, and throat doctor or an otolaryngologist. There, we are the group of physicians who have the training and technical equipment to actually look at the voice box. Just as if your knee hurt, you would not go to a doctor who could not examine your knee well, it's difficult for you to get good treatment for your voice if you're uh, going to be getting care from someone who's not able to actually look at it. Now, the next person in our team is our speech language pathologist. They are the rehabilitation specialists of the voice. So with many voice problems, it's not just a surgical or medical intervention, but it's also a system where we need to teach you how to use that voice box in the best way possible for the longest duration of good voice that you can get. And then for some cases, we may need to also have a voice coach. Now, I'll admit that this is usually limited to our um, performance artists, but most of us can benefit definitely from the speech language pathologist in certain cases do need the voice coach. So what kind of interventions do we have to deal with voice problems? One of the reasons people often don't seek care for their voice is they don't know that something can be done about it. So for some voice problems, we do use medications. For others, we go to rehab with that speech therapy. Others do require surgery. And there are also a subset of surgeries uh, that are called office procedures that we can also do to help you restore and maintain your voice. So this is a picture of a gentleman's voice box where after a cold he noticed that his voice had been different for two weeks. However, when we got a good look at his voice box, which this picture uh, shows us, um, there is a difference between his two vocal cords. So you can see the two lumps up top, but I want you to look more towards the bottom of the page, right above my name, where those two kind of the little V shape is. 
on the left side of the V-shape, notice how that side has kind of a pinkish whitish, co whitish color, whereas on the right side of the V, it's more yellow tan. The yellow tan side on the right is normal, and on the left side of the V is not normal. This gentleman, although he only noticed his voice problem for about two weeks, actually had been having a problem that was growing for a longer time, but by coming to the office to have it seen, we were able to deal with it. So for this gentleman, um, I informed him that when we see something irregular like that, um, that the two sides don't match and it doesn't look like um, a simple lump, that we need to have a sampling. And that sampling is called a biopsy and it lets us look at the tissue that composes the vocal cord and make sure that there isn't anything dangerous like a tumor in it. Now, there's two different kinds of ways that we can do that biopsy. One is in the office and one is in the operating room. Each case is a little bit different, but here's a summary of when we choose or have the option of choosing uh, one over the other. Um, I will often offer office procedures to people who are short on time. They have to get back to work and won't be able to take a day off to go to the operating room. Um, they're willing to put up with um, having the camera in their nose and um, us actually giving them the medications to do the biopsy. Some of them have medical problems that make general anesthesia um, kind of a big ordeal for them and they're not um, medically ready and safe to just go to the operating room without really strong evidence that we should. Uh, and others just want proof that they have something that needs to be taken care of before they uh, go for bigger surgery. So those are all good reasons to go for an office procedure. Now in the operating room, anytime we need to do detailed work or we have, um, sometimes we need to use lasers, those are generally going to be done in the operating room. Anyone who's too nervous to do it in the office, I would offer them the operating room again. Um, and surgeries that are larger where we need to remove bigger pieces of the voice box or throat um, are also done in the operating room. But in order to get the best information about what needs to be done, again, first we need to see it, and then we discuss the options, and uh, depending upon each individual, they'll choose differently. Um, just a reminder for anyone who joined a little bit late, uh, we are going to be taking our questions at the end. Feel free to type them in now, but don't be discouraged that I haven't answered them just yet. Um, now here, that gentleman who we uh, just saw the pictures of, um, this is him having his biopsy in the office. That silver cup biopsy forcep is actually going to sample that left side of the V and we'll get the information from it. We give numbing medications, of course, so that he can be comfortable during it. And um, in this particular case, it turned out actually to be an early cancer. And so it was very important that he did not ignore the voice problem that he had. Even though it was only for what he perceived to be a short period of time, it ended up being something that needed to be treated immediately. So here's a more common and absolutely less dangerous problem called vocal nodules. So the annotation N on these VFs, or vocal folds, which is kind of laryngologist ease for vocal cords, the same thing in the voice box, these nodules are kind of like calluses. The middle of the vocal cord has to vibrate that, just like I said before, 150 to 300 times every second. And uh, any of you who do manual labor notice that you have calluses on your hands from the places where you get the most energy and the most friction. So these vocal cord nodules um, are the equivalent of a callus in the voice box from where you get the most pressure. Now we're about to open our video for you so that you can see what nodules look like when they're soft. Okay, while the video is loading, we're going to take a question. Um, Carol Lee asks, before singing, she drinks something hot. And my answer would be, you don't necessarily need to have a particular 
uh, kind of beverage right before you um, are going to sing. What's most important is that you maintain good hydration all the time, which is going to mean plenty of water. And you don't jump in with you. You just show up and start a marathon. You do a good bit of preparation so that your body is ready. So um, soft singing, soft humming uh, are all going to be good. Now there are special circumstances if you have an illness where you may want to have something warm and that is mostly for the steam as opposed to um, needing to put heat into your body. Okay, and now we'll go back to the module. So it should be called soft and what we're is a picture of the vocal cords vibrating. Now that soft flag-like vibration is what we see right here and even though the nodules are still there, they're soft and they don't get in the way of the closure and they let this person make her voice uh, more functionally so that she can get through her day. Okay. Nodules are on both sides of the vocal cords. Uh, they tend to interfere with vibration and also interfere with closure. The treatment for them is speech therapy. So with good speech therapy, you get soft, vibrating texture of the vocal fold nodules. Again, they don't always go away, but they can become more functional. Next, um, another thing that can happen is a polyp on the vocal cord. So a polyp is a red fleshy mass on the vocal cord that also gets in the way of closure, but because it can vibrate at a different note from the rest of the vocal cord, you can get multiple notes being produced by the voice at once, uh, and that leads to pitch inability. So you can get multiple notes at once, or you can flip notes back and forth, and for most polyps, we'll treat with uh, starting with some speech therapy, but the end goal is to remove them in the operating room. up uh, for you video of what the polyp like. and after um, surgery and in the meantime we're going to take another question while that's opening Harita asks I'm a singer and have stopped regular singing for four years. Whenever I sing now for 10 minutes, my throat pains me and I have to stop. What can I do to avoid this problem? Well, Harita, what I would recommend first is that we need to find out why you're having the problem. In order to know what to do, we need to figure out what's happening, why your voice is not able to last in the way that it used to. So I recommend getting an evaluation from someone who can look at your vocal cords with you and help you be educated about it. minor technical glitch, but we can still get through it. Um, uh, what we're going to look at on, again, going back to the V, deep inside, towards not the big lumps up top, those are the arretinoids. Right where the green arrow is, we'll see um, a small polyp. So it's uh, that red fleshy mass. Okay. So we can see that it's a little bit in the way. And then after surgery, we have a smooth edge of the vocal cord, and there is no more polyp. Now, in addition to giving you a smooth edge, it is an improved voice because there's one single note. It's steadier, and it's easier for the person to speak. 
Now, this patient actually was a doctor, and he was not able to do his job with that polyp because his uh, patients, who are mostly children, just couldn't understand what he was saying. So by getting that polyp off of his vocal cord, he was able to communicate better and go back to work. Now, another disease which is actually becoming more acknowledged is reflux disease. So you've probably all heard of GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease, also sometimes called acid reflux. That's when stomach contents flood backwards into the food pipe, which is the esophagus, and they can cause chest pain, heartburn, lots of problems like that. But what people may not be aware of is silent reflux, along with that obvious kind of reflux can also cause damage to the vocal cords. They can cause swelling and inflammation of the vocal cords, like you can see in the picture on the left. Believe it or not, this is a voice box, just like the other ones that you've seen in this, um, in this webinar. But because there is so much swelling and inflammation from the reflux, you can barely recognize any of the structures that we've seen before. And this person's airway is tucked way deep underneath that flap of tissue. Some of the symptoms that we get from people who have the silent reflux are coughing, <coughs> throat clearing, <coughs> and also, unfortunately, lots of belching. Now, in the silent reflux, these can also happen without heartburn and without really being very much overweight. Now, this is an option where we have a medical treatment for the voice and throat problem. We use acid-reducing medication. Most people who have this problem will be placed on a proton pump inhibitor. That's a class of medicines that includes things like Prilosec, the purple pills, uh, Nexium, uh, and the generics, omeprazole, uh, and the like. Uh, now, for some people who have other medical problems and are taking other medicines, we can't use that because it has a bad interaction. So they end up on kind of the quote-unquote older or more established medicines called the H2 blockers, histamine blockers, which also block the signals that lead to acids being produced in the stomach. By reducing the acid, we hope to decrease the inflammation in the voice box and let the voice be made more smoothly again. Now, we have vocal cords sometimes that just plain don't work. One or more vocal cords can get stuck in place if they're not getting the information from the brain from their nerves. Now, it can be spontaneous after a viral illness uh, or a cold, and it may not even be a very big illness, but if the voice change lasts two, or week, two, more, two weeks after, then it's something that needs to be considered. Um, it can be something that happened because of another problem, which we call secondary, so surgery on the neck, thyroid, heart, or also some injuries to the brain and neck can all cause damage to the system that delivers information from the brain down to the vocal cord. Now, some of the characteristics of the voice when we have immobility are going to be a breathy and harsh voice, which can sound sort of like this, where the patients are having bad closure and there's a lot of air leaking, and that's why it sounds really breathy. Um, having bad closure not only makes for bad speech, but it can also make for bad swallowing. Sometimes they don't get good signal about where food is in the voice box, and they can choke. I apologize if you missed any of my comments uh, because the audio video, the 
video, the audio on the videos. Um, if you have any questions about them, we'll definitely go back over them, and I apologize for that. Um, but you can see that there's a big gap between the two vocal cords, and this is while the person is trying to speak. And so this gap, if you go remember back to that, that early slide where we see the vocal cycle, these vocal cords aren't going to get right back to each other, and that is going to cause problems. Now, after surgery, we can see that the vocal cords are right next to each other, and so this person is able to make more normal sound and able to get back to work as a nurse, which is what she was before she had surgery. Again, unfortunately, because the videos um, have sometimes been overriding, we're going to actually skip the video. But I want to tell you a little bit about pore closure, which is a thing that we'll sometimes call glottic insufficiency or a leaky valve. Um, they also can have a breathy, effortful voice, and it will get fatigued. So if we shout all day, of course, our voice is going to get tired. But with normal speech, you should be able to get through the day. If you're getting too tired or the voice begins to break, then we need to bring the vocal cords close together. And we have options for that. Um, along with speech therapy, again, don't forget, we like to uh, do our rehab before we do uh, big interventions. We have treatments including injections to plump up one or both of the vocal cords. And that can be done in the office sometimes or in the operating room. Again, that depends on each individual case and what's really best in your situation, uh, taking into account your anxiety and the reason why we're doing it as well as the material that we're going to use to inject and plump up the vocal cord. So for any of these problems with the voice, how do you know what to do? You and your surgeon together need to choose what to do based on the certainty of the diagnosis, your other health concerns, whether you have high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, um, lung problems, your own schedule, if you can take a day off or if you can't, definitely factors in, and your ability to be still and tolerate surgery under local anesthesia. For some people, the whole idea is just too creepy and they don't want to do it, and so we don't push you. It's just an option. So now we'll go into some things that you can do to preserve your voice for long-lasting function, um, even before you get to the physician if you need help. So first, hydrate. So hydration means water. <laughs> it doesn't include anything that has caffeine, high fructose corn syrup, or carbonation. Carbonation is actually the process of putting carbon dioxide gas into water for, the, for your drink to be fuzzy, fizzy, but what it creates is carbonic acid. And remember, we talked about acid reflux. So pouring acid down your throat um, is not going to be the best way to keep a good voice. Now, I'm realistic. I know that there are lots of us out there who are not going to live without caffeine. So what I would say is add a glass of water for uh, each beverage that you take that contains any of the above. So um, most of us should be drinking about 80 ounces of water or so a day. And that doesn't even need to be fancy bottled water, um, filtered water. Um, if you live in a community where the tap water is great, I would go ahead and use that. Um, but Making water a priority is going to be great for your overall health. Um, it does need to be balanced uh, with your other, other medical troubles. If you have congestive heart failure or other heart problems, consult your general physician before uh, you rapidly increase your water intake. Next, we want to in avoid inhaled irritants. So uh, I don't think I need to get on the soapbox about tobacco. I hope you guys have gotten the message from, the, um, from pretty much all your other health providers. But there are other inhaled irritants. So um, if you're at a barbecue, uh, it's important not to stand downwind from the pit because breathing in all that smoke is going to really annoy your throat and voice box, not your lungs. So we want to stand upwind from all kinds of smoke and as best we can maintain the best breathing air that we can. So sometimes that means if you need to be out in dusty areas, putting a kerchief over the nose. Um, and then at the end of the day, it doesn't hurt to wash the nose out well with saline solution to get all the irritants and pollens and things, dirt, particulates, out of the nose and out down into the sink. Next. 
a clear of URIs, that's upper respiratory infections, common cold, the flu, all those guys. How do we do that? Basic tips, wash your hands often. Um, I am a soap and water kind of a lady, but the uh, gel sanitizers work quite well in situations where you don't have access to a sink and soap. And then after that, keep your hands away from your face. Uh, a lot of us have kind of uh, habits where we are touching our own faces, and this brings the germs of the world that are on your hands right up into portals where they can get into your body and start multiplying and give you a real pain. Next, check your medications with your doctors. There are certain antihistamines for allergies and diuretics for heart problems uh, that can dry you out. And again, without the nice, moist, uh, thin mucus from hydration on the vocal cords, they don't vibrate as well. Diuretics are also sometimes called water pills. And uh, if those are on the list of things that you are taking, it's worth having a conversation with your doctor if you also have a voice problem. Be moderate with alcohol. Think about it. Do you know anybody who's quiet when they're really intoxicated? I don't. So when we're taking a lot of alcohol, it disinhibits us. And what that means is it takes away kind of your usual control mechanisms on your behavior. So you'll tend to be louder. You'll tend to talk more often. And you may also have some other judgment problems. So it's a general safety issue, but it also applies to the voice. Additionally, alcohol is a dehydrator. It's a, another one of those diuretics, and so that's why you actually don't buy beer. You rent it, and then you return it in the restroom. So watch your meals. This is our next tip. We want to keep fat and sugar to a minimum in general, but especially in the evening. They both promote reflux. It's important to distance the end of your meal from the time you're going to lay down flat in bed by at least two, and be even better, is three hours, so that you're not having the material from your stomach backwashing into your esophagus and up into your throat. Remember to keep your friends close. Uh, we talked about whispering already, and whispering is definitely going to put more pressure on the vocal, vocal cords than any of the three voices that we talked about before. Shouting, again, should be reserved for absolute emergencies. Now finally, listen to your body. When your voice isn't working, it's telling you that it needs a break. And if that break period needs to last more than two weeks, it's important for you to come see somebody who can help you with it. So things that should prompt you to get to the doctor, that voice change that lasts more than two weeks, uh, pain when you're making the voice, increased effort, having to work harder to make the voice, increased breathiness, or the sound of a leaky valve, changes in your phrasing, and certainly if you have any swallowing issues along with that voice change. There's a wide range of causes to these problems, and again, the only way to get to the bottom of it is to get to somebody who can look at it. Thanks so much for your attention. Uh, we want to bring to your uh, mind some other events that we're going to be having. Um, later this month, there will be a headache webinar, uh, followed by a stroke and brain aneurysm webinars in May, and a thyroid tumor webinar in June. Be on the lookout for these. And we're going to go to your questions now. Okay, our next question is from just F. If there's coughing from irritation of the vocal cords and it is from reflux, should PPIs cure the hoarseness? Um, that's our target. Um, sometimes there can be other things. The swelling that the reflux causes can hide other problems, and so it's important to make with whom you can get the voice box looked at and who can monitor how and when your, um, your PPI so that we can make sure that you get the best um, results from it.
Next, Michelle uh, asks, what can be done to avoid getting hoarse while thinking? So the first thing is, what does hoarse mean? Hoarse is one of those words kind of like dizzy that means lots of different things to lots of different people. So it's important to be a little bit more precise in defining what the problem is. Uh, when we uh, getting hoarse while singing can be because you have a bump like a polyp or nodules or um, a problem with movement. So um, getting the voice box looked at is going to be critical to finding out what is going on with the problems while you're singing. And D. Bunkley asks us, what can you do to help with vocal fold paralysis? I love that you called it vocal fold. Um, <laughs> that's kind of our insider talk, but it's great. Um, one vocal cord being, par being paralyzed, um, meaning not moving, um, is a bad situation. As we described before, the vocal cords are going to be too far apart from each other to make the ideal vibration. So once we look at which one isn't moving and how far apart they are, we need to think about how long it's been going on. In general, uh, we wait about one year of a vocal cord not moving before we say that it's never going to move again. And of course, that's medical never, which means probably never. Uh, so it's less than one year since it um, stopped moving, whether it was a new or surgery, um, then we'll usually give uh, kind of some supportive treatments with both speech therapy and maybe an injection that doesn't last very long time just to get to that year mark. Once we get to the year mark, or if it's been a longer time since then, since the stopping moving of the vocal cord, then there is actually a surgery where we can um, actually push over the vocal cord in a permanent way so that the vocal cord that is moving can meet it and you can get a great voice that way. Um, we've had several patients that we've treated here at Memorial Hermann and UT um, who've had this problem and um, our results have been um, actually quite great, particularly when th they were able to continue with their speech therapy. So I hope that answered your question, D. Bunkley. Thanks. Uh, Faisbano Riani asks us, is there a possibility that one can lose the voice for good if something went wrong during surgery? Um, so there's two answers to that question, uh, and I know that it's certainly scary. Um, we often think of musicians and uh, opera singers and the like as professional voice users, but truth be told, any of us who uses our any kind of speaking in our job is actually a professional voice user. If you lose your voice, you lose the ability to make your income. So your voice is central to um, what you're doing. Um, there's two kinds of uh, ways that surgery can affect the voice. One is outside surgeries. So surgeries on the neck uh, or the spine or the thyroid gland, those can affect the voice by making it weak. Um, but the other way is actually operating on the vocal cord. Um, it's important to have a good relationship with someone who's going to be considering operating on your vocal cords because um, no operation is without risk. So every time we work on the vocal cord, there is a risk that um, you can develop some problems, uh, particularly scarring, which can be very, very, very bad for the voice. Uh, it's important to have a good deal of trust as well as um, uh, someone who is trained specifically to work on the vocal cords and that's the advantage of the extra year of the fellowship um, that myself and other laryngologists have done and uh, or taking the dedicated time to do the training that's related to it. Um, we are acutely aware that losing your voice is uh, a big problem and we always want to be conscious of it and so that's a part of the discussion before you have surgery what some of the risks might be for that particular surgery. Cecilia asks us, is drinking hot tea with honey and good to drink before singing, or should my daughter just drink water and do soft humming? Um, 
again, hot tea is soothing, but it's mostly for the humidity as you're holding the cup up to your face and breathing in that steam. She may do just great with steam. Um, honey is often used as a lubricant for the back of the throat and a coating agent. Um, it doesn't actually go on to the vocal cords, but it will coat the back of the throat. Uh, so water, cold, warm, all throughout the day is great. And humming and preparing the voice well uh, and using good technique is important for uh, your daughter's voice to be preserved while singing. So Adrian Rumpf asks, what could predispose you to getting vocal cord nodules and can a vocal coach also help with therapy after diagnosis? So the good news is uh, that vocal nodules, again, are not dangerous, they're not a cancer of any kind, but the ladies are actually more predisposed to getting them as well as children. Uh, uh, it's very rare for an adult man to have nodules and so we're thinking that it may be the way that the voice box is put together. The lady's voice box is more similar to those of children than that is that of the adult man. Uh, so the way again the way that we treat them is we take away the inflammation of the voice box so we'll often will treat reflux as a part of at least in a short time and uh, having a vocal coach and speech therapist can be um, they're integral parts of healing for vocal nodules. So you're right on target, Adrian. Connie Roby asks, is clearing your throat before speaking damaging? It is. When you're clearing your throat, <clears throat> you're banging your vocal cords together very strongly. So when you have the sensation that you need to clear the throat, it's much better to have a sip of water or another beverage and let whatever is in there actually swallow down. If you haven't um, basically uh, kind of inhaled something like a bug or anything like that, whatever's in there, you made it and it's okay to swallow it. But if you have frequent throat clearing, it makes sense to have someone look at you and see if you have the signs of reflux so that we can treat it and get rid of that problem for you. Lisa M. implores that she's suffering from hoarseness related to a cold and maybe allergies and she has a vocal performance coming up. How can I improve my voice for the performance? Well, Lisa, this is absolutely one of the toughest spots that the doctor and the performer can be in. Um, some people will advocate for giving you steroids in this situation. Uh, it would be a, a short course just to get you through what you need to for the performance so that we decrease the swelling in the vocal cords, but we need to manage the allergies if that's what it is. If it's a cold, it's just really bad timing and unfortunate. However, trying to push through a cold or allergies that are untreated can actually give you more problems with your voice. You can end with a polyp, you can end up with a bleed in your vocal cord and that will absolutely get in the way of making good voice and rarely but possibly can have permanent damage. So Lisa, I hope you have somebody who's a, a your medical partner and making sure that you uh, want to put yourself at more risk by doing uh, that performance. Maria Fulton asks, can smoking damage the vocal cords? What can you do about it afterwards? 
Smoking absolutely does horrible things to your voice. Um, and it's a range of things, things that are not cancerous, as well as putting you at risk for developing tumors um, anywhere from the tip of the lips down into the tip of the lungs, and we don't know where. Um, you can get cancer on the vocal cords. You can get cancers uh, in the throat from smoking. They're all increase the risk if they're also taking large amounts of alcohol, but smoking by itself is an established risk factor for cancer. Um, so what we can do about it afterwards, step one, work on quitting smoking. That is the best thing you can do for your health if you're currently smoking tobacco or anything else. Um, there are chemicals that are in the smoke that you're inhaling that cause cancer in addition to the heat of breathing in um, basically hot vapors uh, causes damage to the vocal cords. Sometimes there are surgeries that can help the, the heat damage, but sometimes the changes can be irreversible. So um, the best thing you can do for your health right now is to work on quitting smoking. Congratulations on being a future quitter. So, what are some early signs and symptoms of cancer of the voice box or throat from Patience Montgomery? Um, some early signs um, uh, depends kind of on the location. So, on the voice, on the cords themselves, what we will see uh, is a change in the voice. Again, we use that two-week uh, timeline as a soft timeline. Uh, you can get your voice problem checked out sooner, but I would recommend that you get it done no later than two to three weeks uh, if it's lasting that long because the earlier we catch whatever it is, the better uh, we can treat it and the more options we can have for treating it. So uh, other things that can go along with it are pain when talking or swallowing, um, difficulty with swallowing, and um, very rarely when things can get farther along, you can get some bleeding. Uh, and uh, that's why if any of those things go on, it's important to have someone actually look at the voice box. Now, Michelle asks, how can you tell if you have thyroid problems and will this cause you to get hoarse when speaking and or singing? So problems of the thyroid can affect the voice in two ways. One is because the thyroid gland makes hormone, it um, affects the entire body's metabolism. So it can affect your weight, your mood, your energy level, as well as the thickness of your vocal cords. And so a thyroid which is over or underactive can affect the voice. And the best way to have that figured out is to get your hormone levels tested. Now the second way that the thyroid gland can affect the voice is because the thyroid gland actually lays on top of the nerve that controls movement of the vocal cords. And that's why sometimes thyroid surgery or thyroid uh, lumps like goiters can also affect the vocal cords. Um, if you don't have a doctor who's managing your thyroid problems or you think you have one, I would start with your PCP or with an ear, nose, and throat doctor who's also trained, as all of us are, to uh, deal with problems of the thyroid and throat. And that way we can see um, whether your thyroid has anything to do with your voice problem, Michelle.
Now Joanne comes to us. Uh, in 2008, she fell forward from a standing position, striking her throat on the end of a table on the way down. She was examined and told that it would get back to normal, but she still has the need to clear the throat often and can only sing lower notes. How long does it not only take to get back to normal? Well, unfortunately, we're at least two years out from this instance. I would be concerned if you struck your neck on a table that you may have had actually a fracture of one of those cartilages of your voice box. Um, definitely requires medical attention from someone other than a general practitioner who is trained to evaluate um, the voice box structures for, its, for their integrity after an injury like this. Um, it may need some imaging and that would be a CAT scan, um, as well as watching how the vocal cords function uh, with an endoscopy that can be done in the office. That's a video strobolaryngoscopy where we can actually look at how the vocal cords are moving and see how your swallowing mechanism starts and why you may need to be clearing your throat very often. So jo Joanne, I don't know who treated you in the beginning, but I think you should get some medical attention for that um, so we can find out if there are any more options. Now Will, with one L, says after a cold this winter, he went through a period where he had a repetitive, uncontrollable cough at night, but after about two weeks of that, it went away. But that when he talks, everything is fine, but the range of singing is constricted. So what can happen, one of the things that we talked about briefly during the talk was um, problems with mobility that can happen after a virus infection. Um, that can happen from a um, that can happen from a viral infection and that'll give you problems with movement and it may be very subtle sometimes plumping up the vocal cords or getting a tune-up uh, with a speech therapist can help with that so I would recommend that you go to an ear nose and throat doctor uh, or an ENT or a laryngologist so that you can sorry you may hear the life flight helicopter behind us <laughs> so that we can uh, have someone get a look at that voice box and give you some good advice based on what they can see. Well, unfortunately, we've come to the close of yet another webinar. Um, I thank you for your attention and for your participation and the great questions that we had. Um, some of them, unfortunately, were a little bit um, detailed and specific and not able to be answered in this format, and so we welcome you to seek guidance from your, from your medical professionals, uh, keeping in mind that someone who can't look at the voice box can only give you limited advice about the voice box. So um, I wish you all the best and have a blessed day. Thank you very much.